Oxford is undoubtedly one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Every year, millions of tourists flock here to marvel at the glorious quads, soaring spires, and wondrous architecture. But in this most historic of cities, there are more treasures than just the buildings. We're here in the Ashmolean, the world's first public museum. We're going to speak to some of the curators and see what treasures they have in store for us. The Ashmolean was founded in 1683 to house Elias Ashmole's cabinet of curiosities, but it moved to its current site on Beaumont Street in the mid-19th century. It houses everything from 10,000-year-old antiques to modern art, but we decided to focus on four key pieces. Sarah Doherty showed us around and took us first to the shrine of King Taharka. King Taharka was a North Sudanese pharaoh, and by which I mean a black Nubian pharaoh. Um, it's made of red sandstone and um, it's dedicated to several um, Egyptian gods, uh, which is interesting in itself because it means that um, the Sudanese pharaoh, the Nubian pharaoh Taharka, is wanting to become an Egyptian pharaoh. So he's using all of the traditional um, crowns, all of, and he's worshipping Egyptian gods, but in a Nubian manner, which is um, really interesting for us as archaeologists. So could you tell us a bit about some of the features on this wall? Absolutely. This wall is particularly interesting because here you have King Taharka offering um, a white bread loaf. The bread is a symbol of um, sort of giving er every day that you would give food and offerings and bread and beer and every good thing to the gods. And this scene is particularly interesting because it shows Taharka offering to the gods of Luxor, the gods of Thebes in Egypt. So here you have a Munre, Mut, Khonsu, the moon god, and Montu, all of whom are Egyptian gods in Sudan. Next, we travel to 9th century Anglo-Saxon England to see one of the Ashmolean's most beloved exhibits. Now, I'm very excited about this particular item because I learned about it in my first year. But for those who didn't study British History 1, <laughs> what are we looking at? This is our Alfred Jewel, our very most famous Alfred Jewel. Um, it was probably made in about 871 AD and made for or uh, on behalf of King Alfred, the only king as yet to be called, Alf to be called the Great. They would use um, items like this, which are called astles, which are a little bit like um, Jewish priests use them when they're reciting the Torah. They would use these as a pointer to point out the different writing uh, and read it aloud. In this time, you weren't reading but from yourself, you were reading orally to usually quite a big crowd of people. So what's the, what's the so, other text say? Alfredus mech het Guerdon, which basically means Alfred ordered me to be made, and crucially in Old English. I see, and it's a very ornate item. Is that typical for the Anglo-Saxon period, or is it a rarity? Um, you do get some items from um, from Viking period times, a bit earlier, which um, which use a lot of kind of Welsh gold and um, other on other precious items. Enamelling was quite new, though. We couldn't get through the Ashmolean without looking at some famous coins, so Sarah showed us the Oxford crown. Okay, Sarah, we're looking at a coin. It's a very pretty coin, but uh, why are we looking at it? What's special about it? Well, like almost anything here, it's about the background, the context that is significant. This coin was minted in 1644, a key date for the history of Oxford, but this was when Charles I came here and used Oxford as his parliament and as his capital of England during the English Civil War. Just about make out a uh, Magdalen Tower, and then is that the University Church of St Mary? That's right, so you can see All Souls Church, these two little spires at the bottom, and then the Church of St Mary just off High Street. Uh, very um, obvious feature still today. Having had our fill of coins, we decided to look at something a little bit different. For that, we spoke to Matthew Winterbottom, curator of sculpture and decorative arts at the Ashmolean. So this is obviously very beautiful, but I'm not entirely sure what it is. So what are we looking at? Well, this is the great bookcase. This is an amazing um, cabinet for books uh, made over three years between 1859 and 1862 for the architect William Burgess, who was a kind of Gothic fantasist. And this was used to house his collection of books on architecture and art and sculpture. So the decorative scheme sort of explains that. 
There's a strange mixture here of uh, Christian religious imagery and pagan religious imagery. So what explains that medley? Well, it, the bookcase is divided into two halves between the Christian and the pagan arts. And each little um, um, panel here, uh, each by a different artist, um, tells the story of a different aspect of the arts. And, and one side is the pagan side and one side is the Christian side. So the left-hand side is Christian and the right-hand side is pagan. So we go along the top. Uh, these different panels here tell the story of poetry. So here we've got Dante with the dream of Beatrice. Here we have architecture. Um, this is um, St John with the Kingdom of Heaven in Jerusalem, looking at the, the wonderful um, semi-precious stones that form the foundation of the Heavenly Kingdom of Jerusalem. So that's the Christian side. And then on the um, pagan side, we've got Rhodopis, who was a courtesan in ancient Rome, ancient, sorry, ancient Egypt, uh, ordering for the great pyramids to be built. It's a false story, but it's, a, it's told by Herodotus, so that's why it's in there. And then at the end, we've got Sappho um, uh, uh, with Phaeon. So again, that's a story of poetry. So poetry, poetry architecture architecture the treasures we've looked at today are all free to see so if you're interested in peaked come and check them out yourself